Namani. Hello, my name's James Tyler and I'm an artist based in Tandanya, Adelaide on Ghana land in South Australia. So I'm a Ghana person and I'm going to share some of my knowledge around Ghana plants. The theme of this presentation is Mayata. Ghana country is a living museum collection. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains area of South Australia. And I extend my respect to both elders past and present and emerging. So the Ghana area has an estimated 1500 indigenous plants and of that about 30% are threatened species. Uh, in Ghana language, about 60 plant names were recorded at the point of colonisation by the British. And of that, we can identify about 50 plants. There's 300 plants from the region that have known indigenous uses and 120 of those plants are edible and 180 of those plants have medicinal uses. Other facts that are interesting around plant knowledge is that there's 800 animals to indigenous to the Adelaide Plains area and there's about 170 names that were recorded in Ghana language and those names do relate to plants and the and the relationship between plants and animals. We also have six seasons that were historically recorded but only four that we can locate against the Western calendar, four season calendar. Uh, cultural material, at the point of colonization, 90 objects were recorded with, in Ghana language with 70 in everyday practice with an, a further 20 items that had ceremonial significance. So during this presentation, I'm gonna draw on information how I've come across this. So I gain Ghana knowledge in a range of different ways. So Adelaide was colonized in 1836. Prior to that, there was some whaling and sealing in the region for about a 30 year period. And then after that, it was systematic colonization. And the place that was first colonized on the mainland in South Australia was Tandanya, Adelaide. And that was home to my people, the Ghana people. My family actually comes from about 100 k's north of Adelaide, but it's still on the Ghana nation. And so a lot of information around plants, animals, our history, our cultural objects, ceremonies and stuff had been lost because of colonization. But there were a series of different ways that we're being able to get our information back from either colonial records at the time that documented Ghana culture or information from neighboring language groups, as well as just re-engaging with plants in the region to get a better understanding of how to make cultural material. So one of the most iconic seasons is Waltati, which is summer um, from June, February and March is the contemporary calendar. And the contemporary calendar was made with the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, uh, with Ghana elders, trying to locate the best time for our seasons. And so our hottest months are um, January through to March. Uh, this plant, which is a coastal succulent, um, Nyanki, on the left-hand side, um, has an edible leaf. Uh, you can eat it raw or cooked. And then a very similar plant on the right Kakala um, has an edible fruit that tastes something like a fajoa or a guava, but with a salty taste. And sometimes it's called a salty fig. Um, it's quite delicious. The leaves can also be eaten and cooked. Um, Muchu was a name recorded by the German missionaries Teichelmann and Sherman at the Piltawadli Mission in about 1838 through to 1840. Uh, they recorded the majority of these names, but they weren't that easy to locate. So 
sometimes they had to be cross-referenced with neighboring language groups. Uh, Wadney, which is a little berry called the Nida bush, and it has a almost like a salty flavor to the berry. And you can find it growing all down the coast or in any dry arid areas or salt lakes. Um, it takes up the salt flavor, but it's salty and sweet, kind of tastes like a grape um, and is very drought tolerant. Uh, Mirnu is our general name for the waddish, wattle genus, but more specifically, we use it for the golden wattle, um, which has an edible seed, as well as you can see on the uh, right, we have Minu Yaku, which is a type of resin that can be diluted in water and it makes a high calorie drink. And so it was drank a lot during summer and because it's water soluble, it, you don't get it coming out during the winter months when it's wet. So it's more of a summer fruit. You might still get it in the next season um, of autumn, which is Parnapi, um, but really it's a summer um, staple. And you can ferment it into alcohol. Um, so it's an amazing versatile um, kind of resin. It can be used to fasten um, axe heads on, but you can't then get the it wet again because it will dilute. And so this was recorded by Teichelman and Sherman as well. Um, and information about when you collect it and when you process it was in that information. So Pana tea, April, May and June is our autumn season. Um, and Pana, meaning a specific star that we see, which is Venus, uh, when it's associated close to the moon, um, indicates the season of Pana tea. And Pana P is mushrooms. And there was about five species of mushrooms recorded, but there's about 30 that have known um, indigenous uses in, in the Ghana area. Um, so the one on the right hand side can be used to carry fire, where the one on the top left hand side, uh, Wanka Wanka, um, is used for treating oral thrush. And it was recorded by the missionaries as being used to treat a venereal disease and that venereal disease being a fungal infection um, and being thrush. Uh, another staple um, plant was Tanda Tuta, which is kangaroo grass. So Tuta is our general name for any kind of long species of grass, but Tanda Tuta is a contemporary name that we use to in for this specific thing, kangaroo grass. Um, and this amazing recording by Edward Stevens about just outside of the Adelaide CBD used to be an area that was covered in kangaroo grass and it used to grow as high as your head. And But today it will only grow to your knee because the conditions since British colonisation and that changing of the climate has meant that the conditions for growing the grass isn't as optimal, so they're not growing as big, it's not producing as big a seed, um, and fire played an, an important role in that process. But this could be ground in and you could make a Johnny cake out of it, which you could eat. Um, and some communities in Australia are starting to revive that practice. Uh, the seed itself I've tried and it tastes quite nice. Um, another practice that is coming back in Southern Australia uh, fire practices have been used across Australia for thousands of years uh, to reduce the reduce the heat of a um, fire. So fire is a natural part of the landscape for germinating seeds. The the smoke and even the fire play a role in that process. And Aboriginal people have harnessed fire for thousands of years to make the fire less catastrophic, time it perfectly to germinate seed which in turn can make the environment more optimal. And prior to Aboriginal people being on the Australian continent, only catastrophic fires um, were the ones that germinated seed and that could happen irregular. And observation by Aboriginal people made it very specific when, how and how hot to burn something to get the best outcome from the environment for germinating seed. But it could also be used for hunting as well. 
So it's an amazing part of our environment. And for Ghana people, we're recently starting to burn country again um, and burn grass to promote um, regrowth. But it's unlike fires since European colonization, which have become catastrophic and damage our environment. Uh, we do it at a low intensity. And this image that you can see in front of you of this fire is so low that about two minutes after the grass was extinguished, there was already insects crawling over the top of the burnt um, charred grass. It was cool by that point and it was only two minutes later. So that's kind of the level of fire. It should never really go too far above your knee um, or your side. You don't want it to be going up into the tree canopy and damaging things. Trees should be refuges for plants um, and animals to grow. So it should never get up that to that height because then it be, starts to become catastrophic and the fire is too hot. Um, and burning should happen in different um, different environments. So a grassland should be burnt more regularly, maybe every couple of years, where a forest less regularly, but still maybe in four or five years, where other places like gullies shouldn't have fire for a while because they have plants that are less tolerable to fire. Another important plant that uses fire and also creates fire is kuru, which is the grass tree. So we use the, the flower stem for spear making. Um, we also use it to create fire by using friction to um, rub two sticks together to get fire. And you can do it in a, in a matter of like 30 seconds to two minutes um, by yeah, rotating it into another grass tree stick. And because it is a flammable um, plant, it also works as a fuel for the fire. Um, so it's a, it's a really amazing thing. We also use the resin that comes out after a fire to make a, a thermoplastic resin, um, kuruyaku. And we use that for adhering the kangaroo teeth to the top of the middler spear throwers or the, the tip of a... Um, Achaea spear as well um, and it's a really amazing um, material very flexible uh, you can also eat the roots in winter of the plant you can eat the green shoots so it has this like has multiple uses and we have multiple words for parts of the plant uh, different applications for um, using that type of resin as well as pine resin is to adhere stone to the top of um, axes, adds, um, and so like it is a really amazing thermoplastic. And the other thermoplastic that we use is uh, Naranu uh, Yaku. So Naranu being the southern cypress pine gives out a, a white resin which we can heat up in a very similar manner and we can use it for putting onto bucket buckety um, stone knives and it doesn't it's not as uh flexible as the when i say flexible i don't mean in um it's quite rigid but it, you can't reheat this you can only heat it once and then it doesn't want to be reheated where the grass tree resin can reheat so we use them for different applications but it sticks to stone better than um, the kuru yaku um, another tree that is really important for ghana is um, yeah, gum trees and hunting in gum trees. So we use this tool, which is very specific to Ghana. No other cultures in Australia have it that I'm aware of, um, is the wadna, which is, um, we call it a climbing stick and it was best observed by colonists such as George um, French Angus, who was an amazing artist and illustrator, who was the son of George, um, Fife Angus, the CEO of the South Australian company who colonised South Australia, um, he recorded it being used to dig out um, footholds up the tree so you can hunt things like pilta possums. Um, and you can use it in a multiple, it's like, it's a very ergonomic um, tool and you use it to dig out the bark and once you're up the top and you've made all your steps to get to the top, you can use it to stab the possum as well. Uh, you can also use it to debark um, trees for making shields, which I'll talk about later. Um, 
the winter month, which is July, August, September, um, which is Cadlilla, which means the rainy season. So it's indicated by raining. Um, it also doesn't have a star unlike the other seasons. Um, it's just because it's so cloudy and that's when we get the most rainfall in Southern Australia is during the winter months. Um, and so our plants respond specifically to that high rainfall. So a lot of our fruiting happens at, that follows off that as well as some plants tend to grow after the winter rains. Um, another plant that becomes more available in the stormy weather of off the Southern Ocean is um, seaweed collection. And we have this recording which comes in from Maya who was at, um, in Counter Bay, which is actually on Nuttingerry country, but we share linguistically the same name um, as Nuttingerry for seaweed. And it was used to treat wounds as well as um, you can eat a, it has multiple different things. It's high in iodine, so it's really good for um, healing wounds. Um, so it's a good medicinal plant. Uh, wampa, which is bulrush, which you would know from all over the world, grows in a lot of different river ways. Um, <clears throat> for us, we make string out of it. Um, we collect the root, which is wampa, and beat it down. Traditionally, you chew it. Um, and then you can take part of that chewing stuff and make flour to eat. Um, and you can bake it and eat it that way. The tips of it are like radish. The stem is like a leek. It's really, really versatile. Even the pollen can be eaten. Um, but wampa is the one thing that we kind of aim for, which is the root of the plant. Um, that's why the name of the plant is named after the root. Um, because the root is the most significant part for us for this plant making. Other um, Aboriginal cultures use the leaves for different things, but one for the root is what we use for string making because it is so strong um, and it's kind of soft as well. It's a little bit like um, wool in its texture. Um, but yeah, it's mostly used for net making. Um, and you can see one of the net bags up the top, which I've made. Um, the sedge reed is what we use to for basketry and we also make it for string making and you can see in Ghana language we only have one name for both the sedge the basket and the mat which are all very kind of iconic um, South Australian and Victorian Aboriginal design um, but we're kind of on the extremity towards the desert because um, the Adelaide area sits between the southeast of Australia as well as the desert. So we're one of the last areas of that area that uses this sedge to make this type of basket. So we actually don't have, um, we only have one name for the whole thing, both the sedge and, and the process where cultures to the east of us will have names for the specific basket mat and the sedge. Um, so it's these... We can make carriers out of it. We can make bags out of it. It's a and mats. It's a it's an amazing um, material, and we can use other sedges to use as fillers for the coiling. But essentially, just this type of sedge is what we use to do the weaving. Um, Kara is a river red gum, and it's probably one of the most diverse plants that we have so the sea so you can see the leaf up there to the one on the left hand side leaf is a blue gum which we call karu and um, kara is the one to the uh, right and the seed on the right is actually edible if it's soaked and ground and that was recorded by the missionaries as well um, so you soak it and then you grind it into a flower and then you can eat it um, but we tend to only use the bark these days for making shields as well as the wood for making wiris or clubs. Um, you know, you would have heard different other names being used, but the Ghana name for a club is wiri and we use them mostly for throwing, um, but they can also be used for hitting. Um, and we have a very iconic shape of club. So clubs across Australia are very diverse, but ours is... Um, Ours is very specific to our region, the same as our shield design. 
Um, our narrow kind of shield is similar to our neighbors, but it can be identified as being specifically ours. And we take it from the outer part of the bark of the tree. And we do that during the winter months because that's when the most water content is in, in the bark. Um, and a lot of that knowledge isn't recorded by um, European documentation. That's something that we know from basically hand down from elders to other members of the community and shared. And so a lot of um, our contemporary bark making is being done um, by sharing that information. And one of the things that we use is the wadna, which I spoke about before for climbing the tree, but we can use that to dig out the bark around the, the shield shape um, to make a shield. But the wadna doesn't actually damage the wood layer of it. It only cuts through the bark layer, not damaging the tree. So when we do take bark from the tree, these trees live for hundreds of years. <clears throat> and as you can see, the mula barka that's been taken from the tree on the right hand side, um, this tree is still alive um, and it's probably about 200 years old. And so the, the tree just continues to live. And so when we scar the tree, we leave a mark of the, the shield that we took. Many times there's only a couple of shields still left in existence. There's one at the British Museum. Um, there's one at the Art Gallery of South Australia, um, and then there's one in the Netherlands, um, and there isn't too many other um, Ghana bark shields left in existence because bark being so fragile, and a lot of times they're only used once. Um, during conflict, they get damaged and they get discarded, and then you make another one in the next season. Um, so the shield itself doesn't last, but the scars in the trees still live in our landscape and we can still see them. We can see how they were cut and you can still see that the, um, the shape of the shield in the tree. Um, and that shows us as contemporary Ghana people, how they were done traditionally. And so when I say that, um, our landscape is a living museum, um, we can go out to country and see, the scars in trees and so that's so in many ways going out and practicing culture is a living culture a living museum um, which is a really important distinction between european museums that take items out of use um, take plants and dry them and put them into collections and make notes although that information is really important living culture means that we continue we keep it practicing and we develop and um, layer observations that we observe and better practices and processes as time goes on. And one of the ones that has probably been um, the most contemporary process is making shields um, and that sharing of knowledge. And people have all different ways of doing it. Traditionally, you would dry them on the fire. These days, we would put them in a car because the car stays nice and warm during the winter months and it can dry it out really quickly. So our processes change based on our environment and we just have different practices. Um, we still, our practice and culture is still rooted in tradition, but we do have contemporary ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, the plants we engage with are different to the ones that were um, 180 years ago or 200 years ago and before the British colonized. Um, Wiltity. Wiltity is related to the Southern Cross um, and Wiltu, the um, Wedgetail Eagle, and it's October, November and December of the months or spring um, or late spring. Um, and it's generally like the fruiting months. So it's just after winter, all the fruit is quite plump in size. Um, so Tilti is the native cherry and it is... Um, has a small little edible fruit, it's not quite astringent, but it's really nice. Um, the bark can be used for treating um, snake bites. Um, and I think it has an anticoagulant in it, that, um, which with snake bites that coagulate your blood, it loosens it up. So it um, has multiple purposes, but tilti can also be used to make wiris or clubs. Um, that's more... The, our neighbouring language group in the Adelaide Hills is Paramount and they tend to make their clubs out of tilti, but for us, we just use it mostly for eating. Uh, Guti, um, the Kwandong, the one at the top right-hand side, um, has an edible fruit. The tree can be used for carving. Um, it's quite an amazing um, 
plant, the seed kernel can be left for, for about a year and because it's got a toxin in it, but it breaks down over time. And then you can eat the nut. Um, the native currant at the bottom, I, my mum used to pick this plant in the 70s in the Adelaide area and make jam out of it. And it was a bit of a family tradition to go about... Um, the location's about an hour north. It's a very rare plant. It is a, it's got a, um, a fungus that helps it to produce fruit. So the plant can grow anywhere in the southeast, but it actually needs a type of fungus to produce the fruit. And so there's only a few locations where it actually fruits and still exists. And my family, um, it's not hu- this one's not a really well documented in Western records, but my, my family used to... Um, yeah, harvest this plant. And we have one name for it, which was recorded in Narunga language. So we had to borrow that name. So sometimes we need to borrow names where it's been lost because of colonization. Uh, this is an interesting plant that's used for treating colds. And in some cases, some species of the indigenous flax is edible, the, the berries, but the um, pl- different parts of the plant can be used for either weaving or used for medicinal uses, but we call it uh, kuriki yuri, which is um, the sulfur crested cockatoo ear. Um, and as you can see, um, the feathers, um, the leaves, uh, this is not a good example, but the leaves fan out in the same way as the crest of the sulfur crested cockatoo. But if you go into the ear, you can also see a very similar fan shape. So. When we talk about this plant, it's in relationship to um, the shape of the feathers on the head um, and in the ear and how it fans out. So Kudaki Yuri, the sulfur-crested cockatoo ear, is the indigenous flax. Another plant that we um, can make into alcohol um, is the tama. Basically, it's a banksia. Um, Banksia being named after Joseph Banks, but we have our own names for this plant. We also have multiple names for the, for different parts of the plant because it is so versatile. We mostly only use it for its nectar and we soak it in water and you can make a sweet drink out of it, which is recorded here by, um, Tykerman and Sherman. But we know from other neighboring language groups that it can be fermented into an alcohol, which has a quite sweetish banana flavor. Um, yeah, and again, our word, um, pipakawi or pipaawi, however you want to pronounce it. So pippa being spike and awi, but in this case, kawi, water, spiky water. So when we translate it, we know it's the, it's the cones of the flower that is, um, brewed, but you actually have to pick this plant um, early in the morning before the birds get to it and suck all the nectar out of it um, and before the insects are attracted to it to taint the flavor of it and to get the most nectar out of the plant you have to pick it in the morning and we use a specific type of hook uh, made out of a stick to hook them down put them in wash them in water that releases the sugars into the water then you can drink that or you can ferment it for a a week or so um, yeah to make a, a, a sweet drink or a fermented drink Uh, We also have something like 15 different types of yams. Uh, They're a bit smaller than other species of like domesticated plants, but nutritious and they still can produce a lot of small yams. And Walyu is a type of, um, yeah, basically a type of um, lily. Uh, We call them chocolate lilies or vanilla lilies. And that's like they produce the heaviest fruit and they just have a little pink flower, which you can see um, in the next photo. Um, But under the ground, you get these and they're just like little blades of grass. And you get really good at identifying the different types of blades of grass um, out of season to when to pick them. But you will know um, the flower specifically because it smells like chocolate or it smells like vanilla and it's a little pink flower. pink flower with a, um, a purple stamen. Um, and then we have nyampa, which is a yam daisy, very popular in Australia after Bruce Pascoe's dark emu. Um, but there's at least two types of yam daisy to the Adelaide area. There's a small one and a big one. 
um, and they have different flowers as well as different leaves and they have a carrot like um, white yam um, and at the right time of the year it's sweet, out of season it's bitter um, and so yeah you can cook it and make it into a sweet um, gooey um, yeah, piece of food to eat. Um, and they used to be harvested particularly by women using a kata or a digging stick. And, and because we're the people of the Adelaide Plains, Ghana, these would have been prolific growing in grasslands on the open plains that were created by fire. And then women would go in the spring months, identify them by either their leaves or their flowers, dig them up, and then um, you would cook them in a ground oven or on top of, um, yeah, on top of the coals. Um, an interesting uh, insect is a gutlabadi or a firebug. Um, this is a native bee and they are generally used to pollinate um, a lot of the flowers. In this case, it's a vanilla lily, a walu, um, from the slide earlier. Um, they're quite endangered because of the um, pindi gutlabadi, the introduced um, European bee. Um, but yeah, so we have, ed, you know, about 30 different types of bees within one kind of language group or one area of, or one, um, ecosystem. And yeah, so in this case, I'm pretty sure this is a blue banded bee. Um, and it's, and it basically they pollinate everything from, um, the native plants to tomatoes, which can only be, um, pollinated by native bees, unlike, um, the European bee because the, the, the amount that the wings vibrate um, to allow the pollen to be transmitted. So our native bees are really, really important. We have carpenter bees. In other parts of Australia, they, they produce honey, but for us, they just um, basically, yeah, pollinate our flowers. But for one reason which we are, are unsure about, the old recording is gutlabadi, which is fire bug and we don't understand the relationship between fire and the bug it could relate to um, the kuru plant which has an association with um, fire and it and some of the um, bees end up living in the um, kuru plant anyway i just wanted to share with you some ghana plants and how we understand them in relationship to our landscape and how we've learned both from like missionaries journals as well as going out and practicing culture as well as information that we've learned from elders and how practicing culture becomes a living museum or um, and a living space and a living um, practice of culture rather than something that you normally would see um, still in a museum case um, we kind of activate it and live it and it keeps on evolving over time as culture changes as new things come into our environment we find new practices and different ways of doing it and practicing yeah our culture which informs our identity which we pass on to the next generation so for us country is a living museum so um, understanding this knowledge is really important to keep that um, living culture going. Um, Natalia, thank you for listening. Um, Nakara, uh, see you later.